awesome. I see some Medina people. It's good to have you guys. Man, awesome, awesome. It is so good to see all of you guys, and I am absolutely stoked to be at the best week of summer uh, with all of you here. Uh, and I gotta tell you, man, last night, uh, I was able to be here last night and I was able to sit in for the session a little bit. And wasn't last night absolutely amazing? And you guys, can we just, can we just give a hand to God for what he accomplished last night? It was incredible. And um, it, was a, it was such an amazing kickoff to, uh, to our week that we're gonna be having together. I, you guys, I absolutely loved what Mark said last night. I, I love how he uh, just drew our attention to uh, the things that we, we build our life on, the foundations, and really causing us to think through what are the things that we're building our life on and are they, are they actually durable enough to sustain the weight of our life? And I love what Mark said. He said, the only thing that is really worth building our life on is the love of God. And I guess it was so amazing to watch uh, all of you praying last night, confessing to God last night, I know for some of you, I got a chance to hear that some of you dedicated your life to Jesus last night, which is amazing. So we wanna thank God for that as well. But I, I need to tell you, I need to tell you this, that um, while I was here, so I was actually sitting up here last night and I was watching all of this and I was praying for you. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I was praying for you and I was thinking of you, but I also couldn't help thinking of myself. And the reason is, is because uh, momentum is actually a very, very uh, critical part of my story, of my own story. So momentum is actually where my walk with Jesus began. And so uh, if you guys have been at momentum in the past, uh, chances are good. You've probably heard bits and pieces of my story before, but basically my story goes like this. Um, when I was about 17 years old, so just before my 17th birthday, uh, I was actually invited to come to momentum uh, as a teenager. And uh, at that point in my life, I was not a follower of Jesus. I, uh, I honestly hadn't give God much thought at all. Uh, I certainly was not living for Jesus by any stretch of the imagination. And so for whatever reason, uh, I agreed to come. I did not know what to expect, uh, but I came to Momentum as a teenager. And I actually remember uh, during that week, I heard for the very first time, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard the message of Jesus's love for us. The message that Mark shared with you last night, I heard that for the first time. And I actually remember, I actually, uh, and I don't know if I would have had the words to articulate this at the time, but I remember that when I heard the message of the gospel, uh, there was three things that, at least three things that were going through my mind. The first thing was this. I remember I heard about Jesus, I heard about his love, I heard about how he died for us and how he invited us into a relationship uh, with him. And I remember thinking to myself, I remember thinking, this is true. Uh, God is real and Jesus is true. And I don't even know how I know that, but there's something inside of me that as we were reading the Bible, I was cut to the heart. And I remember just thinking, I know that this is true. And then the second thought that went through my mind was I remember thinking this, I remember thinking, well, if I actually start following Jesus, like if I actually go all out for, for Jesus, I remember thinking, what are my friends gonna think? Because remember, I wasn't following Jesus at all. And I remember thinking, this is, gonna, this is gonna require me to change my life. And I don't know what my friends are gonna think. I don't know what all my family is gonna think if I really start going for it with Jesus. And then I remember the third thought was this. My third thought was, well, honestly, it doesn't matter what other people think because this is true. And so I either live in alignment with the reality that Jesus Christ is my savior and I live as he, if he's the king of my life, or I live a lie. And uh, it, was, it was at Momentum uh, Youth Conference that I remember that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And they gave us an opportunity to come forward. And I actually came forward sometime during that week and I devoted my life to Jesus. And I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, uh, for me, it actually was not a super emotional thing when it happened. For me, I just remember I was thinking to myself, if this is true, if Jesus is real, that this demands my whole life. And I'll just be honest with you guys, that moment, that first momentum that I was at was a defining point in my life. And my life trajectory took an entirely different course. From that point, I ended up going into Bible school and I ended up going into ministry. And then somehow, I don't even know how, I'm back up here again at Momentum. And I'll be honest with you, it's always a little surreal when I speak at Momentum because in a lot of ways, it kind of feels like a full circle kind of thing. I'm kind of back where I started with Jesus. But let me tell you why I tell you all of that. The reason I tell you that is not just to tell you about me. The reason I tell you that is because I want to express to you, to everyone in this room, whether you're a student or you're a leader or no matter who you are, 
I, I want to express to you something that I desire for every single one of you, what I desire for all of us who are here today. And, and let me just say it this way, what I don't desire, what I'm not saying, my, my desire for all of you is not that you come to Momentum and then one day go into full-time ministry and maybe one day speak in front of a bunch of people. That's, that's not what I'm saying. For some of you, maybe that's what God has for you, but that's not my deep desire for you. My deepest desire for every single person in this room, and something I've been praying for uh, ever since I was asked to speak is this. My deepest desire is that you might have, is that every one of us might have a real encounter with the living God this week. That we might have a true, inner, not, not just that we'd have a fun time this week, which I hope you do. Not just that you build good relationships with other people, which I hope you do. Not just that you hear some motivational stuff, which I hope you do but that you actually have a fresh or a first encounter with the living God of the universe. Because you guys, I believe, looking back, that that is what transformed my life. Momentum didn't change my life. Now, hear me, God used momentum. He uses momentum to change people's lives. But it was the God of the universe. It was an experience and an encounter with God that ultimately changed my life. So guys, that's what I wanna to talk to you about with the time that we have here today. I believe this, I believe that when a person has a true encounter with the living God, that there's three things that happens in that person's life. And this is actually what I wanna invite you to think through with me today. I think here's what happens. When we have a true encounter with God, we truly encounter God, the first thing that happens, I believe, is that we come to see, we come to see God as he truly is. So, so in other words, we come to see God as he really is, not as we hope him to be, not as we think him to be, not as we prefer him to be, but as he truly is. I think the second thing that happens when we have a true encounter with God is we come to see ourselves as we truly are. I believe the only way that we can really find our true identity is in the presence of the true God. And then here's the third thing that I think happens. I think that we come to give our lives entirely to him. So those three things, when we truly encounter God, we come to see God as he truly is, we come to see ourselves as we truly are, and we come to give our lives entirely to him. So guys, I want to show you uh, how this kind of takes place in a person's life, and I want to encourage you, if you've got your Bibles, why don't you open them with me? We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 6, okay? So in the Old Testament, I want to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, and you guys, I just want to tell you right now, we're going to spend pretty much the rest of our time camped out right here in this one passage of the Bible, and so I would love it, love it, love it if every single one of you had a copy of God's word in front of you. So open your Bible, get it open to Isaiah chapter 6, because you guys, I believe that one of the ways that we truly encounter God is through his word. His word is one of the ways that he speaks to us. And so I want you to have God's word open in front of you, and we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6. Now, as we work through this passage, let me just tell you what we're about to see. We're about to see an account of a man who had a true encounter with God. And I believe that as we read about Isaiah's account, as, as his experience, his encounter with God, I think you're going to see that those three things that I just mentioned happen in Isaiah's life. So Isaiah chapter 6, hopefully if you're there, uh, you, you're ready to go. So Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to start off in verse 1. So here's what Isaiah says, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. I'll give you a second to get there. Isaiah 6, verse 1. Isaiah says this, he said, in the year... The king Uzziah died. I saw the Lord, and he was high, and he was exalted, and he was seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. All right, let's hit pause there for a minute, just one verse in. So I want you to notice what Isaiah says. Isaiah is telling us about a, about, a, about a situation that happened in his life, and he says in the year that this guy named King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. He says, I saw the Lord. So in other words, this is an account of a man who encountered God. I want, I want you to notice what's interesting is not only does Isaiah going to tell us about this encounter that he had with God, he also tells us when he had this encounter. It says in verse 1, he says, it was in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, you might be asking, is that significant? Is that significant? And, and, and I just want you to know that, yes, it is significant. Uh, the Bible does not include any details that are unnecessary. And so without getting too deep into it, here's what you need to know about King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a king in Judah, okay, which is where Isaiah was from. And he had been the king, get this, for 52 years. And now the Bible says that King Uzziah is, has died. And so I just want you guys to imagine, this is a highly anxious, a highly uncertain time for Isaiah and for his people. And yet Isaiah says that in this year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord, I saw the Lord, and he was high and exalted, and he was seated where? 
where is he seated? On a throne, on a throne. And if I could paraphrase, you guys, I think this is what Isaiah just said. In the year that the earthly king died, I saw the true king. I saw the real king. I saw God and he was on a throne and he was in control. So Isaiah sees God. He has this, and, and we're not exactly sure how Isaiah saw this. We don't know if this was a vision or if this was, if somehow he was like teleported into a spiritual dimension. But the Bible says that Isaiah saw the Lord seated on a throne. And then look what it says here in verse two. It says this, it says above him, above him, Isaiah chapter six, verse two. It says above him, there were seraphim. There were seraphim. Now, some of you might be going, what exactly is that? What is a seraphim? So a seraphim, some of you know this already, a seraphim is actually a variety of angel. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Bible's going to say there's actually different kinds of angels. And one of the kinds of angels the Bible tells us are these, these angels called seraphs, and plural is seraphim. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind when I say that there was angels around the throne, but I don't know why, but it seems like in our culture, when we depict angels, a lot of times that we do it, we, we, we depict them as uh, like chubby babies with wings. Did you guys ever notice this? Chubby babies with wings. Look, look at this one baby over here on the right. So cute. Isn't that a cute baby? Everyone say, aw. Saying, aw. Uh, smack your lips and go, aw. That, yeah, aw. So, so let me just tell you guys, I don't know where this picture came from, this idea of angels, but let me just say that if you and I were to stand and see the angels that Isaiah is talking about, if we were to actually see them, our response would not be, aw. Our response would be, ah! that would be our response. Because these things are, you guys, these things are terrifying creatures. Look what the Bible is going to say about these seraphim. It says they're, they're seraphim. They each had six wings. These things, these things have three sets of wings. And the, the Bible is going to say with one set, they're covering their face. With one set, they're shielding their feet. And with another set, they're flying. Now, why do they have six wings? Why do they have six wings? Well, can, can I just tell you guys, have you ever noticed this? Have you ever noticed that whenever God makes creatures, whenever God creates things, he usually creates creatures in such a way that they are custom made to survive and to flourish in their habitat. Do you guys ever notice that? So... For example, when God made fish, uh, God gave fish gills and he gave them, you know, fins. And why did he do that? Well, because their, their natural habitat is the water. And so to flourish and to survive in the water, they need to be equipped with those things. Or birds, like when, when God made birds, he made them with feathers and he made them with wings and he made them with light bone structure. Now, why did he do that? Well, because they need to be able to survive and flourish in their habitat and their habitat is the, is the sky. These angels have six wings. Now, why do they have six wings? I believe it's this. I believe it's because their environment required it. What was their habitat? These creatures, these angels, their habitat is the immediate presence of the glory of God. And so the Bible says they need six wings because they need one set, you guys get this, to cover their eyes. Now, why are they covering their eyes? Well, I think it's this. I think it's because the Bible says that no one can see God and live. That our eyes, you guys, our eyes cannot behold God in his glory. So they're covering their eyes. Then the Bible says they're covering their feet. They're also covering their feet. Why are they covering their feet? I actually really like the way one Bible teacher said it. He said, he said this. He said the reason that they covered their feet was because it was a, their feet are a symbol of our creatureliness. I thought that was really good. It's a symbol of our creatureliness. Did you guys ever think about it? Our feet, our feet are where our bodies touch the ground. Our feet are usually the first things to get stinky and dirty. I don't know about you, but my feet are kind of nasty. I don't know about you. Uh, I don't have any big toenails. I don't know if that's too much information for you. <laughs> but I don't have any big toenails. Um, they look like chicken nuggets. I, uh, I, so funny, I actually tell people this funny story. I actually lost my big toenails at Momentum when I was a teenager. And so I always tell people at Momentum, I found Jesus and I lost my toenails. And I think it was a good exchange. I thought it was worth it and, uh, and stuff like that. But anyway, I, beside the point, they're covering their feet. So they cover their face, they cover their feet. They have another set of wings. And the Bible says with that set, they're flying. They're pro probably not like this, but they're flying around. Now, why are they flying? Well, angels according to the bible are messengers that's what they are and that what did that mean it meant that they were always ready always ready to go wherever god wanted them to go so so isaiah sees the lord you guys he has this vision he has this encounter and he sees god god is on a throne there's these crazy angels that are all around him you guys and then 
Look what the next verse says. Check this out. The Bible says in verse 3, it says, and they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. So get this picture, man. These angels are flying around and the Bible says that as they're flying, they are shouting so thunderously that it's like an earthquake. You just imagine. Imagine that the whole, this whole room just shaking as these angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. Can I tell you something I think is really interesting? Do you guys notice in this passage, who are they shouting this out to? It says they're shouting out, do you notice, to who? To each other. I think that's so fascinating. These angels are not saying to God. They're not saying, God, you're holy, you're holy. They're not saying to Isaiah, Isaiah, he's holy. The Bible says that these guys are shouting it out to each other, they're covering their faces, they're covering their feet, and they're flying, and they're just shouting to each other. It's almost like they're going like, he's so holy. And the other angel's like, I know. You know, you tell him. And he's like, he's holy. And they just are shouting it to each other. And can I, can I tell you guys something I think is so cool? I believe that this song that these angels are singing is a song that they have sung from eternity past, and it is the song that they will sing in eternity future. In the book of Revelation, we're actually told that this same scene is still happening. I believe, you guys, I believe this is happening right now, that these angels are still shouting out to one another, he is so holy. And do you guys notice something? Do you notice the Bible tells us that they say it three times? Three times holy. Let me ask you a question. How many times does the Bible have to say something for it to be important? Once. When the Bible says something twice, that's really significant. When the Bible says something three times, that's of utmost importance. Uh, Did you guys know back in Bible times, if you wanted to emphasize something, one of the ways that you emphasize things was you used repetition. That's how you would do it. And so if you wanted to stress something's importance, you would repeat it. I'll just give you one kind of, I think this is kind of a fun example. In the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us there's a group of people who fell into a very deep pit. But if you look at it in the original language, it actually says that these people fell into pit pits. That's what it says. These These weren't just pits, these were pit pits. These were the pittiest pits of them all. Right? Turn to your neighbor and say, pity pit. Right? It, was a, it was a very, very pity pit. So, so if you wanted to stress something, you would repeat it. By the way, uh, quick homework assignment for all of you this week. This is my, 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 moment, my momentum challenge to you. I want to encourage you, sometime this week, emphasize something by repetition. Just give it a shot. All right? So for some of you, by the end of the week, some of you guys, your room is not going to stink. Your room is going to stank stank right it's going to double up so so when the bible says something once it's important when it says something twice it's really important when it says it three times so get this you guys in the entire hebrew bible this is the only time a word is repeated three times holy 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 you guys if you and i were to stand into the immediate presence of god one of the first things that we would recognize is we would see god as he truly is and one of the things that would most stick out to us is that god is holy that he is so holy. Have you guys ever had this happen? Have you ever had it when you meet somebody? And the first time you meet them, there's one characteristic that stands out so much about them that it almost seems to overshadow all other characters. You guys ever have this happen? So I remember in college, for example, one time I met this guy. I had a, a friend introduce me to this guy, and he was a basketball player, and this guy was seven foot one. Um, now I, I'm only six foot four, and uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm five nine, like on a good day, right? So. So when I met this guy, I couldn't even help myself. When I met him, the very first thing I said to him, can you you imagine? The first thing I said when I saw him, I was just like, tall. I was like, you're you're tall. And I felt like such an idiot because I'm like, like he doesn't know that, you know? So I was just like, you're you're tall. You're tall, tall. Like you're really tall. And he's like, I know. And I was like, yeah. And and everyone I talked to about this guy, like, have you ever met that guy? They'd be like, oh yeah, that guy's tall. Now, that guy was other things, right? He had other characteristics, but when you stood in his presence, the first thing that you realized was how tall he was. Or what about this? I remember one time I got invited to speak at this event in Alaska. It was really, really cool. I got invited to go speak at this thing, Uh, but the only catch was it was in the dead of winter in Alaska. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's like parts of Alaska that get in the dead of the winter, they get zero daylight. 
And as a result of that, it gets like, it gets very, very, very cold. And so I remember when I flew up to Alaska, I got off the airplane and I walked out into the Alaskan air in the dead of the winter and I could not help myself from saying one word. You guess what it was? I was like, it's cold, it's cold. I was like, it's, it's the only word. I'm like, cold, 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 it's cold. Now, Alaska is a lot of things. Alaska is mountainous. Alaska is breathtaking, it is beautiful, but in the dead of the winter, when a human being steps out in, the, in Alaska, the first thing they notice is that it's cold. If you and I were to have a real encounter with God, the first thing that would stand out to us is that God is holy. Listen, God is a lot of things. God has many attributes. God is just, absolutely. God is kind, com completely. God is loving, of course. John, our theme passage, 1 John 4 says, God is love. All of those things are true. But listen, three times over, if we were to stand and see the glory of God, we would say he is holy. So that begs a really important question then. If God is holy, what exactly does that mean? What does exactly does it mean that God is holy? That's kind of a churchy word. So let me see if I can give you a definition. Here's a definition of the word holy. The word holy literally means this. It means set apart. It means distinct. And it means unique. That's what the word holy means. So holiness, just kind of get this in your mind, holiness does not mean that God is far away. That's not what it means. It means that God is not like us. God does not think like us. God does not act like us. His ways are higher than our ways. Listen, God is not, God is not just a slightly bigger version than us. He's not just a slightly better version of us. He's not just a slightly smarter version than us. He is, not, he is in a category that is entirely his own. And you guys, if, if you and I were to have a true encounter with God, one of the things that we would recognize is that any, any small or manageable view of God that we might have would be shattered. God does not fit into any categories that the human mind can construct. And when we have a real encounter with God, we start to realize that God, God is holy. He is different. He is set apart from us. And so the angels say he is holy, but then I want you to notice what else the angels say. They say, God is holy, holy, holy. And then it says this, and the whole earth is full of his, say it with me, his what? His glory. Now there's another churchy word. What's the word glory mean? Because I think glory is a really important concept. The idea of glory, the word glory itself literally means this. It means heaviness or weightiness. Heaviness or weightiness. Now some of you might be saying, um, so what does that mean exactly? If you're saying that God has glory, that he's heavy or he's weighty, what does that mean? Well, I think maybe a good illustration might be this. I want you guys to think about the solar system for a second. All right, so we all know how the solar system works. You get the sun and the planets and all that kind of stuff. In our solar system, what is it that determines what revolves around what? What is it that determines that? And I think all of us know this. The answer to that is gravity. So why is it that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around? And why is it that the moon revolves around the earth and not vice versa? It's because, listen, it's because the sun has more gravity. The sun has more weight. The sun has more heaviness. It has more, get this, it has more glory than the earth does. And so the object, the object that has more glory necessitates that the object with less glory is the one that revolves around it. Listen, do you guys wanna know, do you, do you wanna know a characteristic, a characteristic that you have never had a true encounter with the living God. I think a characteristic that maybe you're not dealing with the real God is that God is always lighter than you. He's always lighter than you. Now you're like, what do you mean by that? God is always lighter than you. Well, I think it means this. When God is lighter than you, it means that your ideas and your opinions carry more weight than his. That's what it means. It means that his word is something that you take lightly. It means that if I have an idea or if I have an opinion and God's word says something different, I'm gonna opt for my idea and my opinion because it has more weight in my life. What does it mean that God, that God is lighter than you? It means that he revolves around you. He orbits your preferences. So if you have a preference, if you have an idea, then, then God is the one who kind of bends to your way of thinking. What does it mean when God is lighter than you? It means that you shape him. It means that you edit him. 
It means that if you read things in the Bible that you don't like about him or you don't understand about him, that you have the freedom to just say, well, that's not true. I don't believe that part about God. And, and, and my God looks like this and my God acts like this. And, and we choose, we pick and choose the parts that we like about him. What does it mean when God is lighter than you? It means that your feelings outweigh his word. It means that I look at his word and I say, man, God says this is true, but I feel like this is true. And so I'm gonna go with how I feel over what God says because it has more weight in my life. Listen, you guys, I think that's a sign. I think that's a sign that maybe you're not interacting with the real God. God as he really is. Just, just think about this with me for a minute. I just want you to think about this for just, just a second. You guys, if you had a friend, if you had a friend who never challenges you, if you had a friend who never disagrees with you, if you had a friend who never surprises you, if you have a friend who never confuses you, if you had a friend who never offends you, you guys, I think it's reasonable for us to conclude that chances are good that you have an imaginary friend. True or false? Now, let's just take it up a notch. If you have a God that never challenges you, if you have a God that never disagrees with you, if you have a God that never surprises you, if you have a God that never confuses you, he always makes sense to you and you can always explain him. If you have a God that never offends you, he never causes you to change because I think that we can deduce that you have a figment of your imagination. You're not dealing with the real God. You're dealing with a construct of your imagination. Now, how do you know that you're dealing with the real God? Well, I think an indication that you've had a real encounter with God is that God becomes heavier than you. God becomes heavier. Now, what does that mean? I think it means this. I think it means that you, you begin centering your life around him. You start to orbit him. You begin to, because he has more glory than you do. He is holy. His truth is greater than your feelings. What happens when God is heavier? Your preferences begin to give way to him and his desires. He is the one who edits and shapes you when God is heavier than you. You guys, here's the truth. I think that if you and I were to have a real encounter with God, a true encounter with God, the first thing that would happen is that we would see God as he truly is. And we would see that God is not like us, that he is holy. And we would see that he has glory, that he outweighs us. And, and I think anyone who has had a real encounter with God never walks away unchanged. I think we see this with Isaiah. We see this with Isaiah. What happens when we have a real encounter with God? I think the first thing is that we come to see God as he truly is. But here's the second thing that happens. We come to see ourselves as we truly are. We come to see ourselves as we truly are. I want you to notice what it says in verse five. Verse five, Isaiah sees God. He sees God on his throne. He sees these crazy angels shouting, holy, 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 God is full of glory. And Isaiah's first response when he sees all that is he says, woe to me. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the, the, the Almighty. So Isaiah says, now that I have seen God, I've seen him as he truly is, Isaiah says, now I see something about myself. And what's his response? He says, woe to me. Now what does that mean? Literally, it means cursed. Cursed am I. And he says, and I am, he says, I am undone. He says, in this, I am ruined. Some of your translations say, I'm undone or I'm doomed. So literally, he sees God in his holiness and then immediately he sees himself and he says, I'm doomed. Now, why does he say he's doomed? Because he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. In light of God's holiness, he says, I can see how not holy I am. I can, he's probably saying, man, I, at the things that I said, those things that I did those things that I looked at, all of a sudden, all of that is made known to him in that one moment. And he says, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips. I am doomed. By the way, Isaiah's response that we see here is pretty typical of a response of someone who has a real encounter with God. Throughout the Bible, we are told of many people who had a real encounter with God, and they all look a little bit different, but their responses are strikingly similar. So let me just give you a few, a few examples. Um, in the book of Ezekiel, there's this dude, Ezekiel, and he has an encounter with God. It's not exactly the same as Isaiah's, but it's kind of similar. And he has this encounter with God, and you know what his response is? His response is, he says, when I saw the glory of God, I fell down on my face. He's like, the moment I saw God's glory, I was like, right on my face. Or what about Job? Some of you know Job's story. Job was a man who suffered intensely. 
And the Bible says that he kept asking God for an answer. And finally, God shows up at the end of the book of Job. And he has this encounter with God. And this is Job's response. He says, my ears, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes see you. Look what he says here. He says, man, I, he says, I, I take back everything I said and I sit down in dust and ashes to show my repentance. But what about John in Revelation? We're told that he saw the glory of God. And you know what John's response is? He says, when I saw Jesus in his glory, I fell down as if I was dead. So when John saw Jesus in his glory, he's like, oh no, boom, right down on his face. You guys, I think, it's, I think this is kind of funny. I, um, I've had people say this to me in the past, and I think they're well-intentioned. I think they're well-intentioned. But I've had people say to me, they said, you know what? If I was ever to meet God face to face, I got some things that I want to tell him. I got some things I'd like to ask God. I got some questions. I got some suggestions for God, and I'd like to tell him those suggestions. And so if I ever met God face to face, I would ask him those questions, and I would tell him my suggestions. And you know, my response is, is I always, I always say, um, something to this effect. I say, um, with all due respect, uh, that is very incorrect. It, if you and I were to stand in the presence of the glory of God, our first response would be that we would fall over like dead people. And we would see that he's, he's so holy. We couldn't even, we couldn't stand in his presence because the, the whole earth is so full of his glory. It reminds me of, I don't know if you guys remember, there's this guy named Saul. You've probably heard his story. Saul's in the New Testament in the book of Acts. The Bible tells us Saul was this religious dude and he, he went around and he would persecute Christians. He actually would kill people for following Jesus. And the Bible says that one day he's, he's walking on a particular road and the Bible says that the glory of God shone, shone, sh- uh, came and, and shined on him. And the Bible says that when that happened, he was so blinded by the glory of God, he fell right down to the ground and he was blinded. And then a voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul can't see anything and he says, who are you, Lord? And then the voice from heaven says, it's Jesus who you're persecuting. And I imagine that Saul was probably like, oops, like I really called that one wrong. And I, my guess is he probably thought he was dead. But then what happened? God forgave him. And God restored his sight three days later. And did you guys know that not only did, not only did Saul change his life and the mission of his life, he also changed his name. Do you guys know what he changed his name to? Can you tell me? You remember? Paul. Do you guys know what the name Paul means? I thought this is so crazy. The name Paul literally means small. So you see what happens. Saul's like, I thought I was awesome. I thought I was a big deal. And then I saw God in his glory. I had an experience with God. I had an encounter with God. And now I'm walking away and I'm just saying, I am so small. I am so humbled. And you guys, I think that this is exactly what happens to Isaiah. I think this is what we see in Isaiah chapter five. He says, woe to me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people. You see, I believe you guys, when Isaiah met God for the first time, he didn't just meet God. I think Isaiah met Isaiah for the first time. He could see himself clearly because here's the truth. The created only can understand who they truly are in reference to the creator. Can I just say to this generation, to those of you who are high school age right now, I I really do genuinely feel for you. And one of the reasons that I pray for you so often and I I feel such compassion towards you is because there is such an amazing amount of pressure that's put on your generation to try to figure out what your identity is. I don't remember that being a thing when I was a teenager, but so much it's like you gotta figure out what your identity is and you gotta figure out what your sexual identity is and you have to determine what your identity is. And oftentimes we're encouraged. We're encouraged that the way that we find our identity is that we need to look within ourselves. Who do you feel that you are? Who do you think that you are? Who do you wanna be? Or what happens is sometimes we try to find our identity in how we compare to other people around us. And so like Mark was talking about yesterday, maybe for some of you, that's how you try to find your identity. You try to figure out how do you size up to the people around you? Maybe for you, you're the funny one. And you know what? Maybe compared to like the the, the rest of your friends in your friend group, you are the funny one. Maybe you're the funniest person in your youth group. Maybe you're the funniest person in your school. Maybe for you, you're the athletic one. You're the one who's the best at whatever sport it is that you're the best at. And you know what? Maybe that's true. Maybe compared to other people or compared to anyone else in your school, you are the best. Maybe for you, maybe you're the smart one. Maybe you're the attractive one. 
I understand that. That's a burden I have to bear. I don't know why you're laughing at that. Maybe for you, you're the outcast. Maybe for you, you're the one who never quite feels like you fit in. But can I just tell you, whenever we look to ourselves to find our identity or whenever we compare ourselves to others to find our identity, it's always going to leave us short. It's always gonna fall short. Why? Because the only way that we're truly gonna find who we are is when we compare ourselves to the creator. The created only understands their true identity in reference to the creator, the one who has created us. And so what does Isaiah see when he sees God? He sees that God is holy and he's full of glory. And what does he see about himself? He sees that he is a sinner who is in desperate need of God's grace. He sees that there is nothing that he can do to try to live up to the standard of holiness that he is beholding in front of a holy God. And so he confesses his sin to God. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. There is nothing that I can do. And I want you to notice something awesome. The moment that Isaiah confesses his sin, the Bible says that God forgives his sin. Because look what it says in verse six. It says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand. Now, can I just mention something? These crazy angels with all these wings, notice here, apparently they got some hands too. So I don't know what's going on with these things. These things are crazy. So he flies over, he's got a coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken and your sin has been atoned for. Now you guys, I wish I had more time to get into this, but I want you to know that the altar, the altar is the place in the temple where sacrifices are made for sin. And when, when, when this angel flies over with a coal from the altar, he says to Isaiah, your sins have been atoned for. Literally, the word atone means that your sins have been paid for. So what is this angel saying? He's saying, listen, someone has sacrificed and someone has paid for your sin. God has sacrificed, he has provided a way to sacrifice and to pay for your sin. And in a moment, Isaiah is forgiven. He is completely forgiven in this one instance when he experiences the forgiveness of God. You guys, we talk a lot about God's grace and about God's love and about God's forgiveness, as we should. We should. Those are the things that define those of us who follow Jesus. Without God's grace, we are in deep trouble. Without God's love, we have no identity. But can I just say something? Can I just say this? I don't think you and I can ever understand the magnitude of God's grace and the extent of God's love, apart from understanding the heights of his holiness and the depths of our sinfulness, it's only when we realize how far God has come that we truly understand the love that he has for us. Can I tell you something I love about this passage in Isaiah? What I love about this passage is that we're actually told later on in the Bible we are given further information about this experience that Isaiah had. And can I just show you, this is actually in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is gonna tell us who it was that Isaiah was looking at in Isaiah chapter six. Who was the one who was on the throne? And look what it says in John chapter 12, verse 41. It says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus, Jesus' glory. So you guys, here's the question. Who is the one who is seated on the throne? Who is the one who's surrounded by angels who have to cover their face and cover their feet and are shouting that he's so holy and the earth is full of his glory? Who is the one that if you and I saw in all of his glory, we would fall down on our feet and fall down on our faces if we were dead people? Who is that? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. The same Jesus, you guys get this, who came as a baby The same Jesus who lived a life in relative obscurity and then went to the cross to die for us. We will never understand the extent of God's love until we understand the heights of his holiness and the depths of his humility, how far he has come for you and I. I love what it says in 1 John 4.10, this is real love. This is what real love is. Not that we love God, it's not that we love him, but that he, that the Holy One, that God loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Look at how far he has come to love us. So you guys, what's the only logical response? Well, I think the only logical response when we have a real encounter with God, when we see him as he truly is and when we see ourselves as we truly are, I think the only logical response is that we come and we give our lives entirely to him. We surrender our lives entirely to him. And you guys, this is exactly what Isaiah does. So look what it says in Isaiah chapter six, verse eight. He says this, he says, then I heard a voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? 
who is going to go for us? And I said, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Here I am, send me. So what's Isaiah's response? Well, I want you to notice this. One nanosecond after Isaiah sees God in all of his glory and sees himself in all of his sinfulness and receives forgiveness and receives the grace of God, one nanosecond afterwards, he is volunteering his entire life. God says, who, who can I send? And Isaiah, do you guys notice this? Isaiah doesn't even wait for the job description. It's not like, God, Isaiah's not like, well, what is it that you want, God? God's like, we need to send someone. And Isaiah's like, me, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. I don't even care what it is. Well, the answer is yes, and we'll figure it out later. I, I love the way Pastor Jeff Bogue says this. Jeff Bogue has always said it this way, and I always appreciated this. I think when we have a real encounter with God, we are compelled to give God our predetermined yes. I love that. What does that mean, predetermined yes? It means I've already decided. I've already determined. The answer is yes. The answer, God, God, the answer is yes. What's the question? The answer is yes. Do you want to know a real indication, the true indication that you, have a, you had a real experience with God? I think the real indication is this, that your life is a blank check. You give God a blank check. There is no limitations that you put on your obedience. There's no restrictions that you put on your willingness. God, I will do what you ask me to do. I will go where you want me to go. I will change what you want me to change. I will follow you wherever it is that you're asking to me to follow you. You know, I think what happens sometimes, you guys, is rather than giving God a blank check to our life, I think what happens sometimes is we give God gift cards to our life. I heard one pastor say this, and I thought it was so helpful. You guys know how a gift card works, right? You know how this works? So if I, if I was to give every single one of you a $50 Chick-fil-A gift card, if I was to do that, which there's a lot of you in this room, so I don't like this illustration. If you were to give me a $50, I like this better. If you were to give me a $50, you guys know how that works, right? Um, I can't take that gift card and go try to use it at Walmart. I can't do that. Why? Because it is a limited amount to a limited location. That's what a gift card is. And for some of us, you guys, that's what we do. We give God gift cards. We say, okay, God, you can have a limited amount in a limited location of my life. You can have access to this part, but you can't touch this. God, you can have Sunday. You can have Sunday morning for a couple hours here, but you cannot speak into my sexual identity. That's mine. And I, and I, I will not tolerate your voice in that space. So here's a gift card. God, you can have this particular space in my life, but don't touch my future. I already have my ambitions. I have my 20-year plan mapped out. And so don't mess with that because I, I've, I've already given you, I'm going to give you, and listen, I think you guys, one of the indications that we've had a real encounter with God is that we see God as he truly is. We see his glory. Our life begins to orbit around him. We see ourselves for who we truly are in our lives. Our lives are given to him. How do we get to a place that we can say like Isaiah said, here I am, send me. How do we get to that place? And here's what I believe, you guys. I don't think that you and I can say what Isaiah said until we see what Isaiah saw. And I don't mean that means that you need to see God on the throne with a bunch of angels around him. What I mean is, I think we see God as he truly is. And then we see ourselves as we really are. And as a result, we give God our lives fully. So I want to invite the band to come up, you guys. And as they do, I actually want to end by doing this. I actually want to end. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. But I want you just to simply do that. I want you to put everything away. I want you to sit quietly before God with your hands up like this. Just put your hands up. Palms to the ceiling. And here's what I'm asking you guys. We have a full week ahead of us this week. We have a full week ahead of us. And I want to tell you what I believe with all of my heart. I've been thinking and praying about this. So eyes closed, palms up. You guys, here's what I've been thinking about and here's what I've been praying about. I believe that God wants to have an encounter with you. I believe that God has done everything to, to, to create a relationship opportunity that you can actually know who he is. He has given us his word. He's revealed himself to us. He has given us Jesus who has died for our sins. He's given us his Holy Spirit so that we can follow him and we can be led by him and we can keep in step with him. He has done everything so that we can have. So the question isn't, does God want to have an encounter with you? He does. 
I believe God wants to meet you this week. I believe there's things he wants to say to you this week. I think there's things he wants to encourage you in this week. I think that there's things he might want to change in you this week. There may be a stuff he wants you to surrender this week. So here's the question. Do you want an encounter with him? He wants one with you. It's not the question. The question is, do you want one with him? So let me just ask you a couple of questions, and I just want you to pray through these with God, just between you and God. Are there any places right now in your heart that you are unwilling to give God access in your life? Are there any spaces in your heart that you have walked into this conference with a predetermined no? You, you knew that you were coming here. You knew that we were going to be talking about God. But you said, you know what? This is going to be fun and I'm going to worship and I'm going to be with my friends and it's going to be good. But I've already determined that if God deals with me about this thing, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Would you let it go? Because I believe God wants to have a real encounter with you. But you can't encounter a God who you're not willing to allow have glory in your life. Here's the second question. Do you want to meet the true God? Do you actually want to meet the true God this week? The real, do you want to have a fresh encounter, a first encounter with the real God? Or are you content with the version that you already have? Are you okay if God challenges you? Are you open to God surprising you? Are you open to God blowing apart categories in your mind of who you think he is to allow him to be who he truly is? If you're willing to do that, I want you just to express that to him now. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you're real. Forgive us for the times that we create you in our own image. We are created in your image, not the other way around. And so, Father, we come to you, the true God, the Holy One, who's full of glory. And we pray that our lives would live in alignment with the truth of who you are. Man, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. The fact that you would come so far to love us. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would open our hearts, make us willing to have a real encounter with you. We ask this and we pray it in Jesus' name.